The next item of business is members' business debate on motion 9376 in the name of Colin Smith on atrial fibrillation in Scotland. And this debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Would those members who wish to speak in the debate please press the request to speak buttons. And I call on Colin Smith to open the debate. Seven minutes, please, Mr Smith. Thank you very much, President Officer, and thank you to all members from across the Chamber for supporting my motion, allowing today's debate to take place about how we can improve care for those with one of the most common types of irregular heartbeat, atrial fibrillation. So what is atrial fibrillation? Well, in a normal heart, the heart's pumping action is controlled by regular electrical messages produced by the part of our heart called the sinus node. Atrial fibrillation occurs when additional irregular electrical messages are sent from other areas in and around the atria, the upper chamber of the heart. These irregular messages make the atria quiver or twitch, which is known as fibrillation, hence the name atrial fibrillation. It's a condition that around 96,000 people in Scotland are currently diagnosed with. It is particularly prevalent amongst older adults, so rates are expected to rise in line with our ageing population. In fact, international data suggests that AF rates could triple by 2050. Given the scale of the condition in Scotland, the cross-party group on heart disease and stroke, which I have the pleasure of being co-convener of, decided to carry out an inquiry to examine how to improve detection, treatment and awareness of the condition. The inquiry process, which included over 250 written consultation responses and, and four roundtable evidence sessions, brought together knowledge from a range of perspectives and the expertise of those involved is clear from the report's 10 key recommendations. However, it was the contributions from those living with the condition which added a real depth of understanding. The voices and the lived realities of those with heart conditions are all too often missing the statistics and the analysis that we use to inform our work on health issues. So I'm delighted that we're able to incorporate into our inquiry so fully the invaluable insights and experiences of those with AF. A recurring point raised in our inquiry was the difficulty identifying and diagnosing atrial fibrillation. One roundtable participant, Gordon, who has AF, told the inquiry, and I quote, I think the big problem is those who are undiagnosed, who perhaps don't have many symptoms, aren't aware that they've got AF, and their risk of stroke or heart failure are very, very much increased. It was a very valid point from Gordon. AF increases a person's risk of stroke by five times. It's associated with heart attacks, and it's thought to be a factor in heart failure. Another participant, Ivan, told the inquiry, I probably had AF for a long time, but didn't know what it was. To me, the condition was unknown. Presiding officer, this response is all too common. I said earlier that 96,000 people in Scotland were diagnosed with AF, but it's estimated that 2.6% of the Scottish population have the condition. That's 145,000 people. That means there are as many as 50,000 people in Scotland today living with undiagnosed AF. One of the key barriers to early diagnosis is the fact that the condition often exists with very limited or no symptoms at all. Indeed, as many as 40% of people with AF experience no symptoms at all, and those with paroxysmal AF often struggle to gain a diagnosis at all due to the intermittent nature of their condition. For some people, the first indication that they have AF is when they suffer from a stroke. Yet with the right treatment, for example, the appropriate use of anticoagulation drugs, the risk of stroke for those with AF reduces by two thirds. Given that stroke is the third most common cause of death and a leading cause of disability in Scotland, the benefits of early diagnosis of AF cannot be stressed enough. As a result, although our report stops short of advocating national universal screening, we do propose targeted AF case finding programmes for those most at risk, as well as more investment in the proven technologies for AF detection. We also stress the need for the government to tackle staff shortages, for example, the lack of cardiac physiologists to improve early diagnosis. But diagnosis is not the only issue. Clinical professionals and people with AF alike raise concerns about post-diagnosis pathways and support, and the inquiry revealed the need for more integrated and specialist care for people with AF. Additionally, there were widespread concerns raised about the lack of information for those diagnosed with the condition. 15% of respondents to an inquiry said they had received no information at all about their condition, and only 33% felt that they had received a detailed explanation. A number of consultation respondents reported that their treatment options were not fully explained to them. One state, and I quote again, I would have been happier if it had been explained to me why other treatments were not for me. Similarly, Richard, who took part in one of our roundtable discussions, told an inquiry that 
Atrial fibrillation is unique to the individual, so each case must be carefully considered to determine the correct course of treatment. It would be good if someone could give an idea of what treatments are available and which are likely to work in each particular situation. President officer, it was clear from our inquiry that more needs to be done to ensure that patients with AF are adequately informed and actively involved in decisions about their care. The importance of information extends to the wider public with the need for a public awareness campaign highlighted by a number of responses to the inquiry, as well as the importance of raising awareness of AF among healthcare professionals. As well as varying levels of information, respondents to an inquiry also reported differences in how often their condition and treatment are reviewed. One stated they, and I quote, would have liked a checkup programme, but had little success in asking about drug changes and risks of current drugs. Integrating multidisciplinary care can allow more opportunities for AF patients to receive appropriate reviews of their condition, provided by a variety of healthcare professionals. For example, community pharmacy could have a particular role to play through regular medication reviews for people with AF. President officer, an inquiry highlighted the need to re-examine how we identify and ultimately treat atrial fibrillation in Scotland, and I'd very much commend our 10 recommendations to the Scottish Government. If implemented, they will drive forward positive change in relation to atrial fibrillation and act as a real catalyst towards improving outcomes and the experiences of people living with this condition. I therefore want to place on record my appreciation to everyone who was involved in our inquiry, in particular, I'd like to extend our gratitude to those who were kind enough to share their personal experiences of living with atrial fibrillation. I'd also like to thank the members of the advisory panel to the inquiry, patient representatives Jim Bruce and Paul Hodson, third sector representatives and their organisations, Wendy Armitage from Chest, Heart and Stroke Scotland, Morvan Dunn from the British Heart Foundation and Colin Oliver from Stroke Scotland, and our academic and clinical advisors, Dr Neil Grubb from NHS Lothian, Professor Liz Newbeck from Edinburgh Napier University and Dr Terry Quinn from the University of Glasgow. They all provided invaluable advice for which we are all very grateful. But I want to give a particular thank you to Kylie Backley from the British Heart Foundation. Kylie invested a huge amount of time and effort in supporting this inquiry and ultimately developing the final excellent report before us today, which I hope everyone involved is proud of and is a real positive example of the work of a cross-party group. President officer, creating a report is only the first step. As co-convener of the cross-party group, working along my fellow co-convener, Alexander Stewart, who continues the excellent work of his predecessor, Mary Todd, we are determined, along with all members of the CPG and advisory panel, to build on the momentum I hope our report has created. And we are committed to working collaborative, collaboratively with the Scottish Government and NHS Scotland to deliver our recommendations and ultimately to make a positive difference to the lives of people living with atrial fibrillation, their families and their carers. Thank you. We move on to the open debate, and can I say we're really pushed for time today, so speeches of under four minutes would be much appreciated. Alexander Stewart, followed by Emma Harper. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm delighted to be able to participate uh, today, and I congratulate Colin Smith in securing this debate. As we have already heard, atrial fibrillation, or AF, is one of the most common forms of abnormal heart rhythm and is a major cause of stroke in the United Kingdom. AF is as we've already heard, the, the abnormal heart rhythm which the upper chambers uh, have to deal with. And the consequences uh, we've talked about, uh, and already heard some statistics again today, 96,000 people in Scotland alone uh, have uh, the complaint. And we are aware that 50,000 people still remain undiagnosed. Now, that's a massive amount of individuals who are, are not aware uh, or, or have that issue uh, that may at any time have to deal with. So it's very important that we have that awareness uh, and the message uh, that we're trying to put out today. In my own region of Mid-Scotland and Fife, 12,188 people have been diagnosed with AF and they will be undoubtedly aware that their condition increases the risk of a stroke up to five times. Stroke is, one, is also the most common uh, cause of death in leading cases uh, and disability in Scotland, with over 15,000 people in Scotland having had a stroke in the past year. I am privileged, uh, along with Colin, to, to be uh, a co-convener of this group, uh, and I've, I've been actively involved in the group, and now have stepped up to take on this role uh, due to, to Mary moving on. Uh, and I'm so thrilled uh, that we've achieved so much already, uh, and I really pay tribute to everybody who has participated. Uh, and I was uh, delighted to host the British Heart Foundation Social Science event here in the Parliament uh, on the first evening in February. Uh, the event highlighted the charity's fantastic research into AF, 
uh, and the cross-party group uh, have repeatedly held an, an inquiry. And that inquiry that has diagnosed treatments and has looked at people living with AF in Scotland. And that launch was a fantastic opportunity for us to give that impression and show uh, the, the case uh, for what we're trying to achieve. Uh, and the cross-party group are doing all they can uh, to move that forward. We heard from two of the British Heart Foundation's hugely knowledgeable scientists, Professor Jesse Dawson and Professor Ton Rutwood, who are both uh, have fantastic insight uh, and are doing all they can to break down the barriers. Uh, both these individuals uh, give examples of what they're currently trying to do uh, and some of the fantastic work, uh, you know, studying single cell uh, uh, heart uh, and taking from individuals who have got uh, uh, chronic uh, illnesses uh, and trying to manage that process uh, and working to identify the types of uh, research that requires to be done so that they can attempt to ensure that every individual is given the most and the best possible chance uh, to ensure uh, that they get that as they go forward. The work is eventually improving uh, our understanding of what the case is and the, and the whole idea has taken place. But as Colin indicated in his presentation, the roundtable discussion with individuals who live with it, uh, who, are, who have got the symptoms and the understanding, uh, that was very useful for all of us to take on board and get their views and feelings about how it is and what needs to be done. And to have the, uh, the scientists there also contributing their part, uh, I think, is, is vitally important. I would like to pay tribute to all who have worked so hard uh, to pioneer new treatments of AF, and I pay tribute to all those who participated in the study and who helped produce the recent publication. The publication is, without question, dear presiding officer, a major achievement uh, and really shows us in the best possible light. Working together at both local and national level gives us the opportunity to support the work of the British Heart Foundation and gives us the opportunity to promote on a platform the scientists, the management, the volunteers, enabling us to ensure that the message is given out loud and clear. In conclusion, we are here to fight hand in hand with the British Heart Foundation and to support them in driving the change for both awareness and improvement of outcomes of people living with AF. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to provide assistance and support whenever I can and play my part in standing up to and standing up for improving awareness of each of the population. Thank you. Emma Harper, followed by Anna Sarwar. Thank you, President Officer. First of all, I'd like to congratulate Colin Smith on securing this important debate, and I'd like to remind Chamber that I am a registered nurse. Colin Smith's motion states that there are 145,000 people in Scotland who are at risk from stroke due to atrial fibrillation, and 50,000 of those people haven't been found yet. I'd like to focus my comments today on detection and diagnosis. In the report published by Heart Disease and Stroke Cross-Party Group, a focus on atrial fibrillation in Scotland, detection and diagnosis is discussed. AF detection and diagnosis is important in preventing stroke in the first instance. This is called primary prevention and also the prevention of a further stroke. This is called secondary prevention. Most folks' hearts beat in a steady, regular rhythm, like a ticking clock, as the report describes. 60 to 80 beats per minute at rest. AF is a heartbeat, it's not regular, it's an arrhythmia. Traditionally, the most common method for detecting an arrhythmia is to use the radial pulse and check for 60 seconds. Putting your hands on the patient's wrist, feeling for the radial pulse. That's the pulse at the thumb side of the wrist, the radial artery. That's necessary to feel and count the beats for one full minute. A full minute allows the trained individual, whether a doctor, nurse, healthcare support worker, or allied health professional, such as a physio or dietitian, to determine whether the rate is regular or not. And an irregular heart rate triggers the need for a further test, a diagnostic ECG or electrocardiograph. Documentation on the current vital signs chart, the NEWS score, or the National Early Warning Score chart, where temperature, pulse or heart rate, blood pressure and respiration rate, and other vital signs such as blood glucose and urine output are recorded, it actually has a prompt now for obtaining and recording vital signs, a box to describe whether the pulse is regular or irregular. And if there is an irregularity detected, then that leads to the further diagnostic practice. The NHS and Free St Galloway Stroke Nurse Specialist I contacted last week, Christine Cartner, said that if an irregular heart rate is detected, it is often at a time of admission to hospital. But by that time, people may already be experiencing a stroke event. Christine said that the main issue in detecting and diagnosing AF prior to a stroke happening happens outside hospital potentially. 
So the new technology that's emerging to detect AF is quite interesting to look at. A simple electronic test can be used to validate the regularity of the arrhythmia called a single lead electrocardiograph. The cross-party group report has made 10 recommendations. I will not be able to review all 10 in the time I have here today, but number one says targeted AF case finding programs for those at risk is something that should be considered. And that's over 65 years, those with previous stroke, and I support that um, potential to look at the technology. And the third recommendation is to invest in proven technologies within general practice to detect AF. So, presiding officer, I like the idea of single lead ECG to diagnose AF, as there's certainly difficulty in achieving a 12 lead ECG with accurate lead placement and exposure of the patient's chest and the discomfort of embarrassment for the 12 lead process. I, I'm sure my colleagues will mention other issues in the report, but I welcome the report and continued evidence-based information to develop the best guidelines to detect, diagnose and treat the 50,000 folk with AF that we haven't found yet. Thank you. Anna Sarwar, followed by Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm pleased today to be speaking in support of my colleague Colin Smith's motion and the important issue, the focus on atrial fibrillation in Scotland, a report by the cross-party group Heart Disease and Stroke raises. Can I put on record my congratulations to both Colin Smith and also all the organisations and individuals involved with the CPG and indeed with the report. I think they've done a service for uh, us all in this parliament and beyond. Uh, because atrial fibrillation is one of the country's most common conditions, affecting as it does around 100,000 people in Scotland who have been diagnosed with the condition. And it's also feared that as many as 50,000 are currently living with the condition, but have not been diagnosed. And the condition does have serious implications, with patients five times more likely to be at risk of a stroke and of those strokes being more severe. I want to briefly recognise the work that all governments uh, have done. I think it's important to stress that I think there is cross-party consensus uh, on moving forward on this and to focus on strokes as one of the Scotland's three main killers uh, alongside cancer and heart disease. Uh, strokes are the third most common cause of death and one of the leading causes of disability. So I think it is right that we give it a focus and a priority. So I want to focus my comments uh, and suggestions in three uh, really brief areas. The first one on the shortage of cardiac uh, physiologists in Scotland. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary, the Minister and I have sparred many times uh, across this chamber uh, on the need for a proper workforce plan and on the need to address acute shortages in clinical staff uh, and the need to address the large number of consultant vacancies. Uh, and perhaps today the Minister might want to address uh, some of those issues as relate to this report. Um, secondly, how we work to improve detection and diagnosis. Uh, the use of new technology in the detection and diagnosis can play a key role in a more accurate diagnosis. Uh, indeed, the diagnosis could be carried out using new technology in settings out with a hospital or GP practice, particularly in pharmacies and community settings, which in itself could help relieve some of the stress and strains in the acute sector. Uh, and diagnostic practices also have to be consistent across the country. Uh, there is a variability across the country in diagnostic services for atrial fibrillation and addressing the staff shortages along with the wider availability of the new technology I think would play a big part in addressing some of the geographical differences uh, in diagnosis. I would also welcome uh, the Minister's comments on how we can ensure a more consistent approach across Scotland, uh, how we learn from best practice in other parts uh, of the country and replicate them right across the whole of Scotland. And thirdly, presiding officer, I want to consider the, the um, care pathway that patients travel, because we know that atrial fibrillation requires a long-term care management plan. Uh, that requires the integration of many members of the healthcare team, including the cardiologists, the nurses, the GPs, the pharmacists, social care staff, uh, and more. And there are good examples of best practice across the country, for example, in Tayside and Lanarkshire, uh, but everyone should benefit from good practice developed by colleagues in other parts of the country. So again, I hope the Minister can take the opportunity to set out her, her department uh, will ensure parity of service, uh, no matter which health board an individual happens to reside in. Uh, because in closing, Deputy Presiding Officer, I realise we are short of time. Uh, the Government does have a key role to play, uh, and I look forward to working with uh, the Minister, with the wider Government, uh, to hearing her comments today, uh, working directly with the cross-party group uh, on this issue and indeed all the organisations that are represented on that CPG to take forward the wider recommendations in the report 
so we can deliver a first-class service for every patient right across Scotland, and that can be an example to the rest of the UK too. Thank you. Uh, could I ask those in the gallery not to show appreciation or otherwise, please? <laughs> um, and it doesn't mean that no, nobody will appreciate Rachel just because they don't clap. <laughs> <laughs> Rachel Hamilton is the last of the open debate contributions. <laughs> wow, I've never had that uh, welcome before. I do welcome this debate today, a very important debate, and I congratulate Colin Smith on securing it. And I must also declare a register of interest as being a new member of the cross-party group on heart disease and stroke. And I look forward to contributing and helping to build on the momentum of the group's work in the future. I remember when I first met the British Heart Foundation in 2016, and it was clear that atrial fibrillation was all too common and yet not well known. The condition that occurs when additional irregular electrical messages are sent from other places in and around the atria, provoking the atria to quiver or twitch, known as a fibrillation, has been diagnosed in 96,376 people in Scotland. Symptoms can include palpitations, breathlessness, dizziness, fainting or fatigue. But 40% of people with AF do not experience any symptoms at all. And as such, the condition may well affect thousands more but remains undiagnosed due to the condition not being known about. And from the information gathered, we expect the actual number of those with the condition could be as high as 145,000. AF can increase the chances of stroke fivefold, as we've heard today, the most common cause of death and leading cause of disability in Scotland. It therefore has the ability to be a life-changing condition and potentially a deadly one. A number of risk factors are associated, associated with AF, including increasing age, high blood pressure, heart failure, valvular heart disease, previous heart attack, thyroid disease, obesity, diabetes, chronic lung disease, sleep apnea, kidney disease, smoking, and excessive alcohol consumption. In January, I welcomed the British Heart Foundation's call for more support to help those who suffer with the condition, some 1,724 in the Scottish borders, I welcome the initiative that encourages the implementation of specialised AF services to facilitate accurate diagnosis and raise awareness. I also want to welcome the excellent work done by Colin Smith and all the members of the CPG and its 10 recommendations to the Scottish Government. It's no mean feat for a committee to gather evidence from carefully selected advisory panels and we thank everyone who helped formulate those recommendations in the report. I also fully support calls to encourage targeted AF case finding programmes for those who are at most at risk, uh, those aged over 65, those with previous stroke factors and those with existing cardiovascular risk factors. As we know, Scotland and indeed the Scottish borders has an ageing population and it is essential that those at risk get the support required. In line with that, the Scottish Government should actively promote and support health boards to implement specialised AF services to facilitate accurate diagnosis, to ensure prompt, appropriate anticoagulation and to ensure patient-centred management. Only recently did the Scottish Borders receive pulmonary rehabilitation services to help those who suffer from COPD, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Before that, it was the only health board in Scotland without such a service. It should not be the case that we find this inequality amongst health boards and ensure that when such a service is rolled out to help those with AF, it is rolled out to all health boards. I am sure that this will be the case, and if it is not, I will help to ensure that it is. Deputy Presiding Officer, I'd once again like to thank Colin Smith for securing this debate and thank the CBG and the British Heart Foundation for their work on the published report. The Scottish Government has much to do to support those 145,000 AF sufferers, but its efforts will, I am sure, be supported by all of us here in the Parliament. I now call on Eileen Campbell to respond to the debate. Absolutely no more than seven minutes, please, Minister. OK, thank you, Presiding Officer. And like others, I also congratulate Colin Smith for bringing this motion forward for debate and glad that we have finally got the chance to do so after weather postponed play last week. 
Um, there is clearly, I also congratulate all the members who have been involved in the, re the report and the inquiry. There has a considerable amount of work has gone into this inquiry from experts, but also importantly, I think, uh, as Colin Smith articulated, importantly the voice of those with lived experience. And I applaud both uh, Colin uh, and Alexander for uh, their clear passion and knowledge of this issue. And I agree, I think, with Alexander Stewart that it's work like this that I think shows the Parliament and its cross-party groups in its best light. So I more generally though, welcome the opportunity to discuss uh, atrial fibrillation in Scotland and the government's work to improve AF diagnosis, treatment and care. Uh, and this has been taken forward by the Scottish Government, NHS Scotland and our third sector partners, including the British Heart Foundation, Chest, Heart and Stroke Scotland and the Stroke Association. And as the motion notes, AF is a common and serious heart condition that is associated with a five-fold increase in the risk of stroke. And although most are diagnosed and provided with appropriate treatment, data suggests that 50,000 people with AF in Scotland are undiagnosed. Points raised, I think, by many others, but certainly from by Colin Smith and uh, Rachel Hamilton. And that's why our National Advisory Committee for Heart Disease and Stroke, which include third sector partners, developed our AF work plan, which aims to support improvement in AF diagnosis, treatment and care. And I appreciate also on that point the authoritative and detailed contribution from Emma Harper, who brought, brought her nursing expertise to bear in how we tackle those issues of diagnosis and treatment. And I'm pleased that the plan's actions and priorities echo the recommendations in the cross-party group's inquiry. Um, and I welcome this concord. I was pleased to contribute to the parliamentary reception celebrating the report's publication to share our perspective and work to improve AF. And again, pay tribute to those who contributed to that event, including those lived uh, experiences and those voices that uh, allowed us to have a bit more colour added to the uh, report's findings. And it was a pleasure to meet many of those who contributed to the inquiry process, to hear from some of those with AF, and also to reflect on our shared commitment, ambitious and consensual, to improve the diagnosis and treatment of AF and the care of those affected by AF in Scotland. And I was pleased to note the progress in delivering our heart disease and stroke improvement plan commitments on AF is acknowledged in the inquiry's uh, report. And this includes the development of AF e-learning resources in Heart E and STARS, both produced by Chest Heart and Stroke Scotland. And these were funded by the Scottish Government, as was a project that tested using smartphone apps to identify AF in primary care, again, using uh, modern technology to help advance uh, treatment. And this progress had uh, galvanised our National Advisory Committees for Heart Disease and Stroke to work with partners to further improve AF provision across the healthcare system. And they produced our AF work plan. Core in this was improving pathways for AF detection and treatment in primary and secondary care. Specifically, this is supporting AF case finding in primary care, effective follow-up in secondary care, and identifying AF in people who have already had a stroke to reduce the risk of further stroke. So in answer to uh, some of the issues raised by Anna Sarwar, um, this report and our uh, work plan provides an opportunity to, to drive forward the improvement I think he was seeking and also to drive forward uh, to drive forward far more consistency across the country in terms of treatment and diagnosis and care. And further to the points that were raised, I think both by um, uh, Anna Sarwar and also though by uh, Colin Smith around uh, 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 physiologists, uh, we are absolutely aware of the UK shortage of cardiac physiologists and the Scottish Government is considering a formal request to add cardiac physiologists to the shortage occupation list for tier two visas and that would ensure NHS Scotland can maximise use of overseas recruitment uh, options. And also, I think, reflecting on some of the points that had been made uh, around care for individuals, uh, one of Realistic Medicine's main aims, shared decision-making by patients and healthcare professionals informed by discussion of treatment options, the AF work plan aims to ensure that the benefits of clinical interventions and technologies are maximised. Person-centred, uh, the, the plan's aims also include raising awareness amongst those at most risk of AS, AF, enhancing patient engagement and in time to use data to measure progress and inform our next steps to improve AF diagnosis, treatment and care. And that was an important issue, I think, to raise about empowering people. And that was raised in, I think, Colin Smith's uh, opening remarks and others about making sure people are at the centre of the care that is going to be involved in helping them to cope with their condition, but making sure that they have an active uh, input into what that care looks like. 
So I want to recognise all of those who contributed to the development of the AF work plan and to note that there were many also actively involved with the cross parties group's AF inquiry. And it's joint work that across boundaries and portfolios such as that to deliver our AF work plan that will deliver the aims of our health and social care delivery plan. We want a health and social care system that's integrated and works together, focused on the principles of anticipating people's health needs, providing the best standards of quality and safety that always puts people at the centre of decisions about their care. Our vision for primary care is at the heart of improvement in AF diagnosis, treatment and care. And we're working with GPs, the British Medical Association, integrated authorities and health boards to implement the agreed priorities for transformative service redesign in primary care in Scotland. Key to this is the new uh, General Medical Services contract, which will see GPs become more involved influencers in the wider system to improve local communities' population health, with GP clusters working to continuously improve the quality of patient care. Refocusing GPs' role as expert medical generalists will see some of their current tasks, where safe and appropriate to do so, carried out by that wider primary care multidisciplinary teams in, in the future. And I think it's also important to know that AF should also be set within the context of our wider efforts to drive forward improvement at a population health level. Heart disease and stroke mortality and incident rates have decreased over the last decade. And that shows our strategies deliver real improvements. But we want to do more to prevent both heart disease and stroke. And we're taking decisive action to address alcohol consumption, reducing smoking rates, encouraging healthy eating, active living and investing to improve mental health services to help support people to live healthier lives. And also added to that and aligned to that is our work to ensure that we can reduce inequalities which manifest those health inequalities that we all uh, want to see uh, reduced. So uh, to conclude, Presiding Officer, I welcome the inquiry report <coughs> and its alignment with the priorities in our AF work plan. I think both reports and both sets of uh, actions give us a blueprint for Scotland to drive forward the improvement and the consistency that we seek to have around AF diagnosis and treatment. And again, pay tribute to the work of the cross-party group and everyone who was involved in making uh, the report and its inquiry uh, so authoritative and allows us to work together to make the improvements that we need to see. That concludes the debate and we will move on to the next item of business, which is topical questions.